Welcome to the Pick Your Lane podcast with your hosts, Chad Robinson and Peter Lount. Featuring successful entrepreneurs and investors who have created financial and time freedom through their passive income and pick their lane through an investment or business in pursuit of bringing them a better future. Now let's get started. All right, welcome back to Cashflow Canucks. Today's guest is Chris Larson. He is the founder and principal of Next Level Income. Chris has been investing and in managing real estate for over 20 years. Well, still a college student, he bought his first rental property at the age of 21. From there, Chris expanded into development, private lending, buying distressed debt, as well as commercial offices, and ultimately syndicating commercial properties. He began syndicating deals in 2016, has been actively involved in over $1 billion of real estate acquisitions. Chris is passionate about helping investors becoming financially independent. Welcome to the show, Chris. Gentlemen, thanks for having me. Very good. Well, Chris, maybe we, we start with, um, you know, I got your your book behind that I've I've already read and uh, maybe start with your origin story. And that kind of, yep. is, in essence, comes out of that in that book. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And if you're listening, you want to get a free copy, you can go to nextlevelincome.com. And if you're in uh, United States or you're in Canada, I'll send you a free copy as well. My wife, um, as you guys know, is from Canada. So uh, this is a real, real treat to be on. Um, with you awesome. guys here, but um, yeah, before I before I met my wife in grad school, um, I was went to college and I was studying uh, biomechanical engineering. But really, my passion during that time was racing bicycles. I raced road bikes specifically. Um, I've done all kinds of racing over over the years, and really, I was just I was just going to college to get a degree. I was going to go turn pro and then come back and kind of figure out what I wanted to do. Um, but I always had this entrepreneurial streak, so I had businesses throughout my uh, high school and college careers and you're know, just to make some money on the side and cyclists don't make a ton of money, even if you're good. So I always thought, well, maybe I should have like a little side hustle, if you will, to um, kind of supplement and, and give me the opportunity to, to live a, a sustainable, um, you know, life or just, you know, have some sustenance really um, during, during that process. And unfortunately, between my freshman and sophomore years, my my best friend, my training partner, my roommate passed away. Oh. I raced another year, but it really it really kind of set me back, um, uh, or or made me step back and think about what life was about. And we're, we're really really fortunate. I mean, if if you're listening to the show, you're you're in a really fortunate place in the world in your life because you know the fact that you know, you can go out and and compete in a sport is is a pretty limited um venture for a lot of people. You know, it's it's a luxury, right? It's a that's a that's a real luxury to say, hey, I'm gonna go and you know participate in this sport for fun. You know, a lot of people, you know, their 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 workout is working on the farm. You know, there's a lot of people that still um live way below um, the standard of quality or the standard of living that we do in North America. I think an interesting stat is if you make $40,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of income in the yeah. world. So yeah. that's a really, that's really, you know, something to think about. And through this whole process, I, I realized that, you know, you need, I didn't, I didn't want to sacrifice in life. I wanted to live life to the fullest. I wanted to honor the life that I had, the, the life that my friend didn't have anymore. And to do that, you need financial resources. If somebody says, hey, here's this opportunity to take a trip, to make an investment, to start your own business, to send your child to the best school that's out there, um, you need you need money to do that. And I, I looked into investing. I had a friend introduce me to the concept of investing in the stock market. I read over 250 books on finance and investing and real estate. I ended up getting an MBA in portfolio management, almost got a PhD in finance. So I really dove head first into the space. And what I came up with was my personal plan was to invest in real estate. Mm -hmm. And I the only shortfall I had was I only had so much capital at the time being a, a early you know, I was 21 when I bought my first property and, you know, it takes some money to make money. And fortunately, real estate takes less than, you know, some other ventures that were out there. So I spent about 20 years in the medical device space as well that allowed me to create um, excess capital that I could then invest in, in real estate. And along the way, as we and now my wife as well found our path towards financial independence, I had a lot of people that asked me and said, hey, what, what do you do? Where do you invest? How did, how did you do this? 
And when I started telling them about what they did, they said, well, can, can we invest with you? And that evolved into, into syndicating our first project in 2016. That was a hundred unit apartment deal in uh, Atlanta. Um, and you know, since then we've, we've acquired over 3000 apartment units. We have, uh, over a dozen self storage facilities. Um, and we are closing actually today on another three, uh, car wash locations. We're gonna have about two dozen car washes now, um, that we right. own and operate, um, all across the, the Eastern, um, Eastern part of the United States from Maryland, uh, down to Florida. And yeah, what we focus on today is, is sharing, sharing these opportunities with other investors, but first and foremost, we, we focus on education. Um, so whether you're really early on in your journey towards financial independence or, you know, whether you're a seasoned investor, you know, we try to provide those resources out there, um, to help those individuals out. That's amazing. I love, I love the abundance mindset. That's uh, that's awesome. Yeah. And that's truly, I think the abundance mindset, Chad, as you mentioned, is that's people say like, Hey, what's the most important thing? That is the most important thing in my mind. Because, you know, if you, if you think, Hey, there's, there's infinite opportunities to make money, there's infinite opportunities to invest and there's enough, there's enough deals for everybody. You know, that is, that is the first thing you need to figure out. If you have a scarcity mindset, or more importantly, if you have people around you with a scarcity mindset, th that's poison in the water. You gotta, you've got to eliminate ruthlessly those types of individuals that are are gonna, you know, are gonna bring you down or say you can't do that. It's not possible. You know, the rich, the rich don't pay enough in taxes. You know, it's like wait a minute. Like there's there's a lot of wealth in this world. We can figure these problems out, but we need to support and encourage entrepreneurs and investors and you know those individuals that are trying to solve these problems because they're the ones that create the jobs the capital the solutions that help you know create things like you know more food yeah. more energy more investment opportunities um you know all, all these things so that's that's really kind of how i how i think in a nutshell absolutely well i love you know, yourself and the other guests we've had on the show too and they all have this abundance mindset and sharing and mentoring and um you know and, and it's great you're putting that book out again for you know putting that knowledge out for a very low cost and like you said you can offer it for free to people as well and and it, people think that now it's 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 difficult but no most what i've my experience has been most successful business owners if you call them contact them whatever and be truly looking for some mentorship and ask them some questions if they know that you're actually going to deploy it and you're not wasting their time they'll share. It's, uh, it's, yeah. it's quite amazing. Yeah. And that's, I mean, the biggest challenge is I, I've, I've been coaching for, actually I've been coaching for, um, as long as I've been investing, I, I coached uh, and, and trained cyclists for a lot of years and then now investors. And the challenge I had was I, I could only coach so many people. And then you say, well, I gotta, I gotta be compensated for my time in some way, shape or form. You know, that makes people buy in, right. If you're paying for it. Um, but we created a court, you know, the course that we can talk about a little bit later on the show here, you know, to really help scale that and provide it to more people. So yeah, the, the book, the podcast, the course, the blog, um, it's all designed to help, help people along the way. Amazing. And yeah. And it's, I mean, you know, some people I'll never talk to and, you know, others, uh, become close friends, other people be become investors. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's become, um, it's just, uh, uh, again, like you said, Chad, I think it's, 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 it's key, uh, to do. And it also makes you better because you're always learning and, and meeting people and, and figuring out, okay, you know, what maybe even challenging your own, your own thought beliefs and patterns. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, your, your book's been out for a little while. I think my, my book launched last summer and the, it was a first for me a few weeks ago that I was noticing on Facebook groups, um, two totally unconnected people to me at all. Um, we're actually discussing my book on a chat. Oh, and, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, wow, that's a first. I just screenshot it and yeah. put it in my, uh, <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, yeah. And again, it's, it's one of those things, you know, you just don't know what an impact it can make, but, um, you know, there's, there's so many books, you know, that, uh, have made an impact in my life. So hopefully, you know, hopefully it helps somebody, you know, along their path. As well. I'm sure it does. So you, where did you, you and Peter met at a conference, right? Yeah. So we're part of a mastermind and, uh, the mastermind is designed to you know, really do exactly what we're talking about here, which is, you know, help people from an educational perspective, also mm -hmm. learn, learn how to analyze investments, find investments, um, that really help drive passive income. And that's what, you know, I talk about my book, you know, there's active income, there's passive income. And I mean, shoot, as you know, Peter, a lot of these investments that we look at are active in some way, shape or form. Um, but you know, how do you create the pathway to have enough money coming in, you know, hopefully from different sources that give you the ability 
to be financially independent because in my mind, and this is the other thing that I, I truly believe, if you are financially independent and you're free to follow the things that you're passionate about and that give you energy, you're going to follow you know, the your true talents inside you. And that is really going to lead to the biggest impact in the world that that anyone and we all can make collectively. I guess the fact that you've got into syndication really speaks to me that you're looking to share with others and build something bigger together. Um, you know, what was in essence, I, I guess, why in your words, why did you get into syndication and what are the outcomes you're looking for in, in those? I know when you get into the, a lot of these investments, you know, everybody, it's easy to get the, get the money in, but how are, what's the, what are the outcomes you're looking for? Yeah. So there's, there's a few pieces of it and it's not entirely altruistic. And I'll, I'll talk about kind of the, the financial benefits from, um, you know, an individual perspective, but, you know, first and foremost, what, what my part, my first partner and I realized was we actually had more experience on a real estate level than the people we were investing in. Now they had more, more specific experience on the, on the syndication side, on apartment management and acquisition side, but it made us think, well, wait a minute, like we have, we have a lot of relationships. We have a lot of experience. Um, we can learn and partner with with these individuals, which we did, um, to do the same thing. Also, when you have that level of experience and you have the capital, there's there's a desire to to have more control, right? So I'd like to be able to go out and find deals that I want to invest in. So what I do is I find deals that I personally want to invest in or sectors that I want to invest in. So, you know, I mentioned car washes earlier. I own a car wash here where I live. And, you know, when you look at the model, it's a small car wash. It's not really conducive to bringing investors in. So when you look at how to scale that, we found a way that we can own a larger portfolio, which means I get to invest in more car washes myself. And, you know, instead of owning one car wash, you know, now we own two dozen car washes and maybe I only own, you know, a small piece of each one of those two dozen car washes and our investors own the majority of that, but I get access to 24 car washes now as do my investors. So it's, it's mutually beneficial from that perspective. Um, also it's, you know, if, if you believe in something, this is one of the reasons I got, I got, um, licensed with uh, as, as a life insurance agent, I'd have these conversations. We even we even wrote a book here um, for uh, for sales professionals talking about the strategy that we call the investment optimizer about how to blend insurance with investments. And we did that because I was doing it myself, and it took me oh man uh, seven or eight years to figure it all out because my agent didn't say hey Chris this is what you could do with this strategy. He actually said wow, it's really cool what you're doing. I wish everybody I worked with did that. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, why, why is my agent saying that to me? So I went and searched for resources that were out there. And, you know, really what, what I found was there's very, there's very few people and, and, you know, Chad and Peter, you guys are, are some of the few people that are out there that really understand both sides of the spectrum, like the insurance side, the investment side, and how do you, how do you put these two together? Um, and, you know, in, in the effort to help investors, I had to get licensed because I couldn't really participate in the process without doing that. So it's, it, frankly, I don't make a lot of money off that, but I, you know, I'm, I'm compensated for my time when doing that, but more importantly, I can actively participate with a friend or an investor that's interested in, in implementing that strategy. Um, so it's the same thing, you know, with the syndications, you know, we have, Oh, um, almost 900 investors now in our investor club, uh, about a hundred million of capital that's been actively invested, you know, nice. over the past several years. And, you know, those, those are investors. They're, they're part of the family, right? They're part of the team that, that we do that. And I couldn't personally buy the deals that we buy without the investors I work with and the investors wouldn't have the opportunity to buy that deal if we didn't put it together. So it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. And if you're listening and you're interested in syndications, one of the important things you should understand when you invest is how, how is the operator, the general partner compensated, you know, does it align, you know, with the limited partner, um, that you work with? Cause it's okay to make money when you, you know, you go and you put a deal together, but you know, it should, it should make sense from both perspectives. Um, and that's the last piece, you know, I was, I worked for a lot of years. I was paid as a W2 employee. I was paid as a 1099 employee. I made, I made millions of dollars in my career. I paid, you know, seven figures plus in taxes. 
And, you know, and when you look at, it, I'm like, wait a minute, there's, you, you hear about Warren Buffett and you hear about Donald Trump and, you know, people that, you know, aren't paying taxes. And you're like, well, people might say, well, that's not fair. And I would, I said, how did they do that? So when you look at how a lot of these hedge fund managers and people like Donald Trump that are in real estate and Warren Buffett that are um, in the stock market, you know, they, they've taken advantage of the, of the tax code. So, you know, if, if you get to a point where, you know, like we did, where we had passive income coming in, well, I'd rather get paid in, in equity, right? Like that's a, we had a great um, woman that came on uh, the podcast here a couple months ago and her name is uh, Emmy Sobieski. And she talked about how to make a hundred million dollars. And the big component of it is you need, you need equity, whether it's in your own business or in a hedge fund or something like that. And that's how you can really take advantage of the tax code and really, really create generational wealth. Um, instead of, you know, making a dollar and paying, you know, 25 or 50 cents in taxes on that dollar that you make, that's really, you're always swimming upstream. In that for sure. Sense. Yeah. I think one of the things that drives me crazy about that media comment, you know, we're saying, you know, these, these ultra rich don't pay taxes and, you know, their personal, their personal tax returns may not be as high, but what people don't do in media often doesn't talk about is their corporations are paying taxes. Their funds Absolutely. are paying taxes. They're employing employment taxes and, you know, corporate taxes up the wazoo, but they're personally maybe not taking out all that money. Um, so that's, you know, people don't, how can you be Absolutely. a multi-billionaire and pay, you know, 500,000 in taxes, but it's uh, their companies pay taxes. Yeah. And it's, I mean, that's a great point, Chad. And that's kind of the abundance mindset. It's like, well, you know, would you, you know, like Elon Musk sold a bunch of stock, right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and he paid taxes when he did that. And he kind of mm -hmm. joked around with, with Elizabeth Warren, but would you, you know, if people looked at it, it actually brought the price of the stock down Tesla when he sold it. And that's that, that actually eroded wealth in a lot of ways. Um, you know, so if you create a business, you know, I mean, shoot, you look at all the real estate we have and all the real estate taxes that we're paying and all the employees we have. I mean, the car wash business, we have over 100 employees alone. You know, the jobs that are being created, the employment taxes that are being paid, the taxes being paid by the employees, you know, that that is directly coming from the business revenue, you know, that we have. And, you know, I mentioned entrepreneurs and how they solve problems. You know, entrepreneurs, business owners, you know, we we all get paid. We get paid last, right? So we pay, you know, taxes to the government, you know, from our real estate, from our businesses, we pay our employees. And then, you know, if there's money left, you know, then, then we pay ourselves. So, you know, that's, you know, it's a, uh, there's, you know, there's risk and reward when it comes to that. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, a lot of people don't understand it's, it can be complex and it's probably easy for me to say from, you know, studying for 25 years now, um, you know, finance and real estate and understanding it, you know, you do start to realize, okay, there's, there's a lot more to the picture than just like what somebody's, um, you know, paying themselves from a W2 perspective and what their, what their tax bill looks like, obviously. Sure. So how are you, uh, sorry, Peter, if I'm jumping ahead of this, but I'm dying to know about the car washes and storage yeah. business versus multifamily sure. and, and those yeah. income and how are those performing assets versus, um, multifamily? Yeah. So if you read my book, um, as, as Peter, as Peter is familiar with, you might say, well, Chris, I don't understand. You're a multifamily guy. Like how, how can you, um, do this? Um, and really I have, I have a framework for investments and it's very similar. You know, if you look at Warren Buffett and his framework is based on, uh, it's, uh, uh, the intelligent, the intelligent investor, um, by, uh, uh, was it Graham? Right. Um, and you know, he's a value add investor and I'm a value add real estate investor. Well, the value add strategy is very, is very similar to, um, what, what Warren Buffett does in, in that we buy stabilized cash flow producing businesses. These businesses just happen to be real estate, right? Like an apartment building. If you have a 200 unit apartment building, that's 200 customers that are essentially paying you every month, you know, self-storage, you might have 200, you know, self-storage units that are, you know, those customers are paying you every month. You know, if you have a car wash, you might have 200 members paying you every month. It's very similar with respect to that. So, you know, we've taken that value add framework and we've, you know, applied it to multifamily and self-storage and mobile homes. Now the car wash business, it's, it's different because it's really, it's really more of a business than real estate. And that, that yields a couple different things. One, it yields more variables. Um, and it was Benjamin Graham, just, um, it just popped into my head, um, was the name of the, uh, the gentleman that was kind of Warren Buffett's, uh, mentor. 
But you know, if you have employees and you have an operation side of a business like car washes, there's more variables there, right? But the other thing is there's more levers that you can pull to create value. And if you can pull those additional levers, you have potentially more upside. So, you know, I, I almost bought a car wash with my uncle several years ago. Again, I, I mentioned we have one here now. So I looked into it. I had coaching clients with car washes. And as I learned about it, I thought, well, these businesses are fairly simple. And you know, this is coming from someone that spent a lot of time in, in the OR with surgeons. I was dealing with um, implants that had, were highly regulated, um, highly engineered, you know, very uh, complex technologies with um, advanced materials that were put in. They're sterile instruments. They have to be customized for patient anatomy, and they have to be you know delivered at just the right time for a surgery. Um, and everything has to work. And you know it's 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 very complex logistically, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a complex sale. There's a lot of data behind it and clinical information that has to be addressed. Whereas a car wash, it it's it's not super simple. It's not a hose with water and soap. It's machines and it's chemicals and it's spray angles and conveyor belts. And there's individuals that are working there in, in our washes, say a half dozen, you know, at a time for a location. Um, and we said, well, if we can take this business, we can look at it from the value add model and we can increase revenues by doing simple things like hiring better employees. Think of Chick-fil-A, right? Mm -hmm. So Chick-fil-A, they don't have the best chicken sandwich in the world, but they have a really good chicken sandwich. And you know, if you pull up, you're probably going to be in and out in about five minutes. You're going to pay a, a very, you're going to get a good value for what you pay. People are dressed nicely. You know, you've got a lot of kids that are in high school and college. These aren't, these aren't highly skilled individuals, but they're, they're paid well. They're treated well. They're dressed well. They're respectful and, and they're taught, they're taught well. Right. So we said, well, what if we can do the same thing in the car wash space? We can dress nicely. We can give, we can give our customers, our clients a better experience. We give them a better value. It's more predictable. And, oh, what if we, what if we pay them a little bit more and we put say one more person per location, what would that do? And what we've seen is a 75% increase in membership sales with our model. Wow. Massive increase. Yeah. Massive increase over baseline. And what that does is it, it takes kind of that short term, you know, scarcity mindset of, Hey, I'm going to pay my employees less. I'm going to have less employees to, Hey, we're going to pay our employees more which is going to create greater long-term value, even though there's shorter short-term risk for us. And what that means is we have greater long-term cash flows, we have greater long-term values, and private equity groups really like this. So um, if you if you zoom out a bit, I was kind of diving into more of kind of like our secret sauce, if you will, to continue mm -hmm. the fast food analogy. But um, private equity groups they like they like yield they like cash flow and as yields have decreased in these institutional quality real estate assets, you know private equity groups have looked for places for further yield. It's going to take about 15 years to build out the express tunnel car wash space. Okay, so we said, well, what if we could acquire or build locations over the next five years so that we can sell them to private equity groups? We can acquire these locations because most of them, 85 percent are owned by groups with four or less locations. Only 15% of operators or owners own four or more than four locations. So it's it's kind of the inverse of multifamily, right? Like institutional quality multifamily assets. And we can acquire at a multiple of seven to eight times EBITDA. And private equity groups are seeing, um, well, we're, I'm sorry, we're seeing private equ equity groups pay 12 to 20x EBITDA for these locations if you can package 50, 100, 200 car washes together because they want to see a large portfolio that's scalable, that they can bring in a large amount of capital that can move their needle, right? You know, So one little 5 or $10 million car wash is not really going to move the needle. A $100 million portfolio is going to have a big impact you know, on a portfolio like that. And what that means is our investors get terrific cash flow and they can see really, really um, big upside, you know, when we sell at some of these higher multiples. Wow. That's amazing. But love that. And maybe just for um, our guests, uh, if you want to go into um, what is EBITDA and how does that, because uh, some of guests might not yeah. actually know what that is. Yeah. So, you know, in, in real estate, we talk about net operating income. So essentially um, EBITDA is the same thing for a business. And what it really is, is it's the difference between your uh, revenue 
and expenses. So it's your net profit, essentially, is your net awesome. profit. And so that talk to you talk to the outcomes then. So people are in, they're gonna get cash flow for a number of years and then we'll get a big windfall at the on the upon that exit. Yes. So we come in again, we are all our locations are cash flow positive. So all the funds that we've released so far, Peter, are cash flow positive from day one. Um, you know, we're seeing as you know, as mentioned, Chad, with that with the increases in membership, um, it might start off a little lower and then it starts to increase as we implement our model. We get our national contracts in place. We see our membership uh, rates increase. So this time of year um, in the United States, you know, it being spring, it's high pollen season. This is when you get a lot of people signing up for memberships, um, which is which is great. Where it's kind of the end of the year, the holidays, people aren't washing their car as much. You know, the weather's not as good, which is kind of it's it's kind of inverse, right? You're like, well, if the weather's not good, you you'd probably want to wash your car more, but in reality, people want to wash the car when it's nice out um, and do that. So that that's what we see. And then, yeah, we're looking at a, a three to five year period of time to acquire and then exit this portfolio. We're over a year into that. So call it another around about three years um, for us to acquire about 50 locations a year um, is our target. Are, are there other areas that you, so your multifamily, your, the storage, your, um, the car washes, any areas that you're looking at or businesses that um, you haven't tapped into yet or are looking into? I know not that you don't have enough on your plate, but um, yeah, good that- question. So we're always looking at different opportunities that are out there. Um, we are one of the areas of focus right now. So, you know, we try to, we try to build out a team and a portfolio in an area. So be it multifamily, self-storage, uh, mobile home parks, car washes, and, and make sure the team is scalable. And you know, then we're able to, if, if we look at another asset class, then we move on here. Um, I would say really, um, I mean, we're looking at um, assisted living, senior living. Um, we're looking at some other things that uh, I can't quite quite release right now. Um, but one of the areas that we're, we're really focused on right now, which which is a, a deal we'll be closing on here in the next month, um, as of this recording, is is affordable housing. So um, nice. we're doing a, a project right now in the city of Houston, and we're partnering with the city of Houston, Houston Housing Authority, to provide affordable housing. And one of the neat things that we've been able to do is we've been able to um, get a structure in place, whereas if if we meet the affordable guidelines for um, it's actually 50% of the units in a property, then the city of Houston waives our tax bill for 99 years. So what does that mean? Um, what that means is it takes about $300,000 to build a unit today. So if the city of Houston said, hey, we're going to go quote unquote, build affordable housing, I say build affordable housing because that like to pay higher than market rates to build affordable housing, that that doesn't really, like in my mind, it doesn't make sense, but that's theoretically what, what would be done. Whereas we can go acquire a unit today for say $170,000, we can bring that unit online as affordable housing immediately with this structure. And what it does for us, the city says, if you don't have to pay tax, well, we're operating around 50% operational expenses right now. So our operating expenses are about 50%. 15% of that is made up approximately from the taxes. So 30% of our operating expenses are from taxes. So if we can drop that 30% now down to the bottom line, we can decrease our revenue slightly from these affordable units. And one thing to keep in mind is rents have risen so fast that we're not going in there and dropping rents way down. We're, we're essentially keeping rents where they were, maybe pulling them back, say 5% for those individuals that qualify. And what that does is it takes, say, a property that wouldn't have really made sense to buy at a four and a half cap, uh, four and a half percent cap rate. Mm-hmm. And it's moving to a six, six and a half percent cap rate in today's market. And we're getting better financing because mm-hmm. the agencies um, that we were, you know, the agency debt that we're looking to put in place, the financing that we're putting in place, we get higher loan to value. Mm-hmm. And we get better terms because they say, hey, your income is better than it, it would be prior. So mm-hmm. they're essentially going to give us more money at better terms than they would before. Um, today, we're putting in long-term debt. So we're putting in fixed rate debt to lower our um, you know, our, our risk with respect to that. But it's something that I've been working on for 10 years um, You know, here locally, looking at different options. And it's really hard to provide affordable housing unless you subsidize it. So it's mm-hmm. this is something I'm really excited about because... It's 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 fairly progressive for a city to go forward and do something like this. It provides immediate 
housing that can that can eat into the 200,000 unit deficit the city of Houston has. It makes sense for us as operators. It makes sense for investors. They're getting a deal that you're not seeing, like you're not seeing the numbers that we're seeing in this deal yeah. um, and anything else right now. Um, and it's it's a true public private partnership that again is, is I mean, it, to me, it's a win. It's a win all around. That's awesome. And your tenant turnover should be less too, right? So, you know what, that's a, I'm, I'm glad you said that Chad, because you know, one of the questions I, I've been, I, I strove to answer, um, during the due diligence phase in, in all this is, all right, how, how are these projects going to perform an economic downturn? And the thing is we don't have a ton of data going back because you know, these programs are fairly new, mm-hmm. but let's say, let's say we, we have a market rate unit at $1,500. Okay. And someone qualifies, they're at 60 or 80% of the area median income, and they're paying $1,200 a month rent. Okay. So they're saving $300. Um, good deal for them. If they said, Hey, I, it's, it's hard for me to afford $1,200. I'm, I'm going to go somewhere and find a unit that's a thousand dollars a month. They're, they're really moving from a $1,500 unit in a $1,500 a month neighborhood to a thousand dollar a month unit. And what you're looking at is you, you're moving neighborhoods. You're, you're moving from a class A or, or B plus property that's been built in the last you know 10 or 20 years to something that's 30 years old plus, and it's in the neighborhood's not as nice. The school districts aren't as nice. Um, the proximity to employers isn't as positive. The amenities aren't as nice. So it's a big step down to do that. And yeah, in my mind, theoretically, if you're paying $1,200 and you're getting a $1,500 per month unit, you probably are going to do more to stay there than somebody that's paying for a twelve hundred dollar a month unit because maybe you're already in that neighborhood and you're just you know maybe giving up some amenities or moving into a unrenovated unit or something like that. And that brings up my final point is we're, we're still renovating these units, so the numbers work in such a way that we're able to go in and we're able to upgrade all of the units, and you know the fifty percent of the units that are market rate, then we can rent those out at market rate and. You know, the residents that are qualifying for these also get an upgraded unit because that's that's the terms of the program. Um, so, you know, we're not we're not just giving the old units, the um, you know, deferred maintenance units, those sorts of things to, to people and and kind of milking the system, if you will. They get they get the benefit of everything that any anyone in all the units gets. That's amazing. And I, Chris, I got to compliment you. Honestly, it's, you know, I'd say you're, you know, the perfect definition of a modern capitalist, which is, you know, <laughs> you're paying your, your employees more. It's also helping your bottom line, right? You're providing affordable housing units, but also providing your investors with a win-win scenario. And, you know, it's proof in the pudding that you can do both. And, you know, it's like the, um, you know, the the triple bottom line approach that has been talked about in school forever, um, you're implementing. And I haven't met too many entrepreneurs that are actually doing it successfully. And uh, yeah, I just got to applaud you. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate it. And again, it's not, you know, it's not a hundred percent altruistic. And I think that's also, but it's also important because you can't, you know, resources are scarce in a way, right? Like Mm -hmm. if you have a dollar, you know, and you need to invest the dollar or buy food or, you know, pay for housing um, or pay for, you know, your kid's education, whatever it may be, you have to make a choice with that dollar. And if you're an investor and you say, well, I want to do this project that helps people, but it's going to pay me half as much. You know, should I do that or should I do this project that pays me twice what that does? Well, a savvy investor in my mind would say, well, let me let me do the project where I make more and then I can just take that half of that profit I wasn't making. I can just give it away. So it's you you really do need you you need um you know the the public organizations, the governments, uh local, federal, um, both to to understand that instead of saying, Hey, we're going to force you to do this, Mr. and Mr. Entrepreneur or capitalist. Um, if you say, Hey, let, let's look and see how it makes sense so we can both benefit. And, you know, if, if the city gives up some tax revenue, but gets all this housing, they don't have to build it. It's cheaper for them. It's immediate. You know, we don't collect the total amount of gross revenue that we could, but the numbers actually work better for us. So we're encouraged to do it, even though it, it may be, it's more paperwork, it's more challenging. And that's why a lot of people aren't doing it because it takes a lot of upfront work, but there's a little bit of a reward in the back end that's, that's higher than if we didn't do it. So it's, again, it appreciate the compliment, but it really is, it's really a, a team effort um, on mm-hmm. both ends. Really good. Uh, I, I was going to ask you, you know, obviously this one, 
that specifically deals with uh, government programs. I, I, want, I was interested, uh, maybe this is um, taking a page out of Chad's book, just understanding, and maybe you, Chad will understand this already, but how are you financing these deals? Obviously you have yeah. private investors, are yeah. you working, like what type of, um, who are you working with that would um, provide, um, you know, the funding for it outside of the, the private investors? Are you dealing with SBA loans, all that? How does that work? Yeah. So if you look at like, you know, since we were just talking about the apartments um, in Houston, that's the same lenders that we work with. So Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, um, you know, we've, we've looked at, we use private um, in, investors, I'm sorry, private uh, capital. You know, if you look at, um, you know, hedge funds and different things, we've used life insurance companies, that's fairly similar. Uh, when you look at the car washes, it's going to be a little different. So you can actually get um, SBA loans for car washes. They're, they're kind of onerous. We don't use those for our portfolios. We're getting commercial loans. So, you know, we're seeing slightly lower loan to values, like maybe you see 60 or 65%, um, with a car wash compared to a high quality multifamily property, which well, actually, frankly, today, that's about what you're seeing. Um, but you know, we were seeing about 70 to 75%, um, LTVs on the, uh, the higher quality multifamily properties. Um, but there, there is money out there. The money's still, it's, it's more expensive now, um, which I'm sure anybody that's listening is aware of. Um, but that's where something like a car wash is nice because, you know, the margins are such that the numbers work, even if you're paying seven or 8%. Um, for a loan, there's still enough margin there where you can make that work. Whereas, you know, if you're buying a, a property at a four cap, a four four percent cap rate, and your interest rate six percent, the numbers probably don't work that well, especially if you're only getting a fifty five or sixty percent um, loan to value. So um, that's uh, that's another really important caveat there. But we have a gentleman who runs our capital markets for uh, most of our properties, and I mean that's what he does full time is is he works with. Um, sources of capital, you know, lenders, large lenders, smaller lenders, um, regional banks. Sometimes, you know, say we'll use local banks um, for car washes, you know, or, or regional banks. Um, especially if we're buying, say, uh, like we're doing now, a, a three um, property portfolio in a city like Chattanooga, we may have a local bank that's going to give us better lending, um, better loan terms than you know a national bank, for instance, because they understand that market a little bit better. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you next was really to uh, we've kind of gone through a lot of the portfolio, your journey and, and um, you know, how the business works and how obviously it's a win win for everybody. Uh, another piece that you add in terms of value to your investors or your community is your is your course. You can talk a little bit about your course yeah. book. Yeah. So I mentioned earlier on that, you know, one of the, one of the challenges with coaching was that there's, there's only one of me and there's only, only so much time. So, um, people would reach out and said, Hey, can you take on another coaching client? I'd say, no, I can't. Or maybe they couldn't afford, um, the coaching, you know, the one-on-one -on -one coaching. So I said, well, you know, how can we, how can we take the framework, the coaching framework that we did and put it into something that's more scalable and accessible. So uh, we put together a course, which is essentially, it's the same framework that my $30,000 a year coaching clients were, were paying um, or getting for what they were paying. You know, we talk about how to make more money. So how to create 20 to 40 hours a week to do more of what you want to do, whether that's a side hustle, spend more time with your family, work on your health. Um, talk about, we talk about mindset, like, you know, talking about, um, think, you know, thinking more abundantly in terms of, you know, what, what does your life look like after you walk away from your, um, your W2 job, you know, the, how long you will live and what the impact is on your world. I know this might sound a little bit, you know, fru uh, fru to some people, but having a three-year vision and the importance of having that anchor. And what I found for through years of coaching was that my clients that had a three-year vision that they were crystal clear on, that they could close their eyes, picture, describe to me, my hair would stand up when they told me about it because it got me excited. They were more successful on a day, on a month to month, quarter to quarter, week to week, day to day basis. There's something there, right? With having that clear vision and that, that anchor and that rudder. We also talk about how to keep more money, tax strategies, estate planning strategies, life insurance strategies, all that is there. My, my attorney, he, he provided his entire course inside of my course when he said, Hey, I, I like what you're doing. Your, your students can have my entire course when they do right. that. So you get, you get access to all of that and all the resources, um, that they provide. And then what people really love the sexy part, 
grow, like grow your money. So make, keep and grow your money. And that's really, how do you invest your money? Do you want to be an active investor? Do you want to be a passive investor? What does that mean? People say, Hey, I want to go, I want to quit my job and go do this. Well, what if you don't like what you go to do afterward? Is that really the best thing? So figure out like what, what is the best option for you as an investor? And then how to analyze investments. We have a spreadsheet. It's awesome. It'll tell you approximately how long it's going to take for you to be financially independent based on the types of investments you're doing on on returns as well as how much you invest. I found that most people that are that are making good six-figure incomes can become financially independent in 7 years with with you know the types of investments that are out there today. And then, you know, if even if you're just a passive investor, if you're a limited partner, we give you all the qualitative and quantitative metrics so you know what questions to ask those syndicators, those operators you're working with because that's really the hard thing. If you don't know the right questions to ask, how do you know if you're getting the right information? Mm-hmm. And then we quantify it so you can give a score and say, "Hey, are these the right investments for me?" And you get you get all that in there and um, if you're listening today, we have a special code. I think we're going to put it in the show notes here. Um, where you'll get you get a third off the course, and and you can get access to that immediately here. That's great. Well, thank you so much. You've gone. We've gone way over time because this is just honestly so fascinating. I, I'd love to. I didn't realize. Yeah, I just looked at the clock. I was like, "Whoa, we're, we've been rolling along here. There's so much more we can talk about." Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. We could spend like a whole weekend talking, but uh, but I love this, and you know, really appreciate uh, you being on. Absolutely. No, it's been my pleasure, gentlemen. And uh, like I said, it's always a treat to talk to my friends here um, up north. Um, it was a rough time during COVID. We couldn't get to go see my uh, my wife's family, but we just flew up there um, over the holidays and we already got our next, next trip scheduled. So um, awesome. yeah, thank you so much for having me on to share. I love what you guys are doing. And so Chris, we have the, the course we're done putting in the show notes with the discount code. Um, and how else do people find you and uh, find more information about what you're doing? Yeah, really everything we talked about, you can you can dig into more at nextlevelincome.com, nextlevelincome.com. If, if you do want to learn more about our investments and getting access to those opportunities, you can schedule a call with our team by clicking on the invest link and that'll that'll take you right to a calendar. You can set up a call. You can learn more about that. Um, but also don't forget to get a free copy of our book. Click on the book link and you can get a free copy, download it or put your address in and we'll send you a copy. Thank you for joining the Pick Your Lane podcast. You can find more episodes on the podcast platform of your choice. Chad and Peter welcome you to visit their site, pickyourlane.com, for access to more content from our guests. There you will find curated interviews, education, and some offerings that will help you pick your lane on the way to financial freedom.